So again, Jesus is teaching, and he's now teaching beside the sea. He's left the house. Um, a lot of teaching takes place in this particular home. It might have been Peter's home. He's gotten up. He's now on the move, and he's walking along the coast. And uh, he's uh, in the Sea of Galilee. And the Bible tells us that a very large crowd. Jesus drew large crowds. And we're talking big, big crowds. Right? So a large crowd of people, so many of them gathered around him. They're pressing in on him that he gets into a boat. Might have been maybe Peter's or Andrew's boat. Or maybe James or John because they were in the fishing business in that area. They used to be. I, I think it says that he sat down. You know, there's a practical side to Christianity. Have you ever tried standing in a boat? <laughs> so I mean, I think it, I think there's a practical side to Christianity. He sits down. It's safer. So he sits down and he uh, begins to teach. And as he was teaching them, he was teaching them in parables. And it says many, many parables. He had lots of these parables. Does anyone not know what a parable is? Would you raise your hand? Are you, are you, you know. You know. Well, I'm going to tell you. Anyway. <laughs> well, a parable is a story that is comparable. You hear the word? It's comparable to something else. So, and what the something else is, is this very important spiritual truth. So Jesus is wanting them to get what he's saying, to understand what he's saying, some spiritual truth. It's like uh, illustrations that the pastors use. You know, we, I save them up. And if I could have a great illustration, I remember one of my seminary professors, one time he used two in a row, and he corrected me. He said, man, why are you wasting them? Illustration. You know, so uh, uh, the parables can be comparable to like an illustration that preachers, you use parables all the time when you're raising your kids, didn't you? Hey, listen, what you did was like this, right? And so we use them all the time. It was a great way to teach, it still is. In fact, the, the word parable means, uh, it's a story, it means to be laid alongside. That's what it means. To be laid alongside of something very important. So Jesus is telling several of these parables on that day. I was thinking, I wonder if somebody was taking notes. You know, would you? I would be taking notes. As he's teaching, he said to the big crowd, he says to this crowd of people, listen. That's unusual for him. Listen. I have a feeling people were chatting. Does that ever happen in church? No. no. And so he says, I, that's what I think. They were chatting it up over here and over here. And then what he was saying to them was so important. He just stops this. He kind of embarrasses people. And he says, now listen. And the word is listen here is what we call an imperative. In other words, it, this word is a command. He is commanding this crowd to be quiet and to listen because what he's going to tell them is so important. He doesn't want anyone there to miss what he's going to say. In fact, the word listen means, it means like not just with your ear, but to take it from the ear, ear into the heart, into the very heart of the person. And he says, a sower went out to sow. As he's broadcasting his seeds, uh, some of the seed fell along the path. In that day, the, the farm, the little the farms were quite small. And, and so you had little property and, and they didn't have fences. They had paths. And the paths um, would separate your little plot of land from somebody else's plot of land. And so it was very easy for the seed, the wind would catch it and whatever it was, but it took for some of that seed to end up on the path. And the path, you know this, was hard because it was pressed down by people. You know, people can do that to your heart. There are some people whose hearts are hard because people have pressed down on them. 
You see what he's saying? He says, some of you have been victims of life. Some of you, maybe somebody here, somebody you know. Do you know somebody whose heart is so hard? When you investigate that, you'll find, you'll find that there are people who have pressed down hard on their life. They're hard because something has happened to them. I love that verse that says that the word of God is like what? A hammer shatters rock. The word of God can do that to a hard-hearted person. But in this case, he's talking about this, this, this pathway, this, this sidewalk, and some fell along. Then it says later on, it says that the birds come. Right? The birds come, and the bird is analogous to whom? Satan. In the comparable, Satan is the bird. And the bird sees the seed of the word of God. But he knows that the person that he's dealing with has been trodden down. Whose heart is so hard. Do you know people like that? Do you know, are there people in your life like that? He knows. And so what does Satan do? Satan comes and steals it. He takes advantage of people who have been hurt. Yeah. And the sad thing is this, is that that person becomes a victim twice. Twice in their life. Because they've been hurt. Some seed falls on a rocky ground. And you know that in that area, the, this is not grounds covered in rocks like we see up here. No, it's not like that at all. It, was, it wasn't covered in rocks. It was, um, it was um, long rock shelves, and they, had a lot, they have a lot of that in, the, in Israel. Underground little thin layers of limestone that, um, that uh, over the top of it, dirt settles. And when that part of the ground um, has seeds scattered on it, the seeds tend to germinate really fast. And they start growing, and they grow really fast. But because the roots are unable to, to find nourishment because of what's below it, what's in that heart, what's in that person's heart, Jesus is acknowledging you see, look, it's a big crowd around him. This, this parable is intended for those people. It's not intended for us. I mean, we get a lot out of it. We can say, you know, as an aside, we learn a lot, a big lesson from this. But the, but the context is Jesus is teaching them. So he knows in that crowd there are people just like that rocky ground. And he's explaining to them why it is that they are not able to go very far with him. Because in their life, in their life, is this underlying shelf of hardness in their heart. Actually, do you know, that, do you know, people, do you know people that cover up their grief? They cover it up. So on the outside, they look, it looks like regular old dirt. It looks like something good could happen on this dirt. But do you know people, maybe you, maybe you, you've had such hurt in your life and you just covered it up. You covered it up. And so this, this plants can't take root. What they do, the plants do this. They push it up. The roots push it up. And then the sun is so hot. We've been in that part of the world. If you've been there, you know that is one hot place. And this is way before global warming. It's real hot there. I don't know what kind of emissions their animal were throwing up into the stratosphere, but it is hot there. The roots pushing up were dry up. He's saying that people, he's saying, people, listen to me. He's saying, look, some of you have been hurt so badly, but you're covering it up. Quit covering it up. Because even though the word of God is so powerful, what will happen is you'll receive it with joy because you're looking for anything that will bring joy into your life because you're so unhappy. 
That's what people do. They look for anything that will bring joy into their life. Some person, some habit, some thing, some stuff. But it doesn't satisfy the soul because there's hurt underneath. Hardness. And uh, the word of God, even though they receive it with joy, because they're looking for anything, dries up. Then he talks about sowing the seeds and it falls somewhere else. Um, it falls on uh, ground that's filled with thorns, um, sticker bushes. And these weed, it's weed and seed. <laughs> this weed and seed is not a good combination. And those pesky weeds grow so big that they tower over the seedlings and over time it chokes them to death. And Jesus identifies that this is worries and cares of the world. The world. The things of the world. You know, when you look at those the, the three examples we have, what do we have? We have the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what we have in this parable. Fortunately, other seed fell on good soil and it produced grain. And you almost want to start clapping after reading about the first three. Yay, at least we're going to get somewhere good here. And uh, so we start, it starts producing a crop. And, and Jesus says, uh, over here it is 30-fold. And over here it's 60-fold. And back here is 100-fold, which is, which is incredible. It's something, here, when you learn this, that you discover that most farmers prayed for an increase of a harvest of tenfold. If they got seven and a half fold, they were happy. But if they got tenfold, they're ecstatic. And Jesus is, what is he saying? He's saying thirtyfold, sixtyfold, hundredfold. That's one of the things Jesus is hoping to get across to the people and to us and to every generation. It's, it, this is the kind of seed that every farmer dreams about. This is miracle seed. It's so powerful, seed. What's the point? He's explaining the ways in which the people in that crowd, the, the reasons why they're, they are responding to him the way they are. And what's going to be the outcome? What's going to happen? Wants them to know. And the seed, and you guessed it, it's in the text, verse 14. The sower sows the word. The seed is the word of God. And his word is like natural seed. That's the comparable. He, I love sunflower seeds. Anybody like sunflower <laughs> seeds? You know, and um. I just do, and I'm a big fan. I like it. I like the ones that are even in the little shell. You know, you just pack your mouth with them. And you have it's like a chip, you know, cracking them and spitting them out. Which my wife, for some reason, is opposed to, especially when we're watching TV. She just doesn't like that at all. I mean, when's the last time you witnessed a sunflower spitting woman? <laughs> like them. You know how you can tell the difference between men and women? One, the men like them in the shell. The woman want them shelled. We know there's a difference between men and women because of sunflower seeds. <laughs> well, here, here, here's something too. What we know is seeds have life within themselves. The Word of God has life within it. Isn't he saying this? Isn't he saying this to the people whose hearts are so hard? Isn't he saying to them, look, the Word of God has life in itself. Granted, your condition right now is this, but the Word of God has life in itself. 
and you who were so shallow and you're so hurt and you have this little thin layer of dirt over your life and you're faking your life and you're making it seem like you're happy, but you're really not. The word of God is powerful. It's so powerful. And the same thing with people caught up in the world. It's powerful because of the potential it has to produce. But in the parable, these three individuals that have the powerful seed of the word presented to them, they are not experiencing the, what the word of God is capable of doing. Why is that? Because there were people listening to him who were writing down maybe the notes of what he was saying that he, in fact, he, he, begins, he begins this talk by demanding that all of them pay close attention to him. Listen, he's saying, take this to heart because he knows the power of the word of God. He knows, in fact, he desires that every one of them, because of the power of the word of God, experience it in their heart. Point of fact, in Matthew's account of this parable, we're told by Jesus himself that the soil, you know, this parable could be called the parable of the sower, the parable of the seeds, or the parable of... <coughs> yeah, parable of the soils. What is the soil in this parable? It's the heart. Matthew tells us. In 319, it's the heart. What is your heart? It's not the blood pumper that's in Bill's chest that might be acting up a little bit. We don't like that. You need to go to a mechanic. The heart is not the blood pumper. People, when, especially when you're young, where Jesus lives in my heart. And they kind of point over here. No, the human heart is... The human heart is that part of your being that's of greatest importance. Far more than the blood pump. The heart is where your soul is. It's where the spirit is found in the heart. The soul is your uniqueness. It separates us from other created beings. Your heart is where your soul is is found. That is, the soul is the mind of the person. It is the will of the person. It is the emotions of the person. That's your soul. It's where the spirit of the human is also. It's, a, it's that part of you that communicates with God. And God communicates with you. It is the spirit is like the soil that, that takes in the word of God into your heart. In fact, the spirit is what leaves the body after you die. Daniel 12 verse 2 says, And many of those who sleep, they die in the dust of the earth, shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 1 John says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has this life, this spiritual life. They that worship God must worship God what? in spirit and in truth. Whoever does not, however, whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Jesus is saying to them, because he knows that that big crowded place where there was lots and lots of people in that crowd there were just there were people just like those sections that he outlines for us over there the path is so hard so impenetrable the person's in a calloused position he's asking the question what is the condition of your heart is it so calloused that the word of God, the gospel, is not able to get through to you 
I went to see this fellow who was very sick and he had been attending our church some and he was very sick. In fact, he was dying. Lived in a real small little cabin. They didn't even have a door on the, the bedroom. They had a curtain over it. I went to see this fellow. I was concerned. I just sensed in my heart, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And I was really concerned about his relationship with God. And so during, I sat down and he's in bed and I shared with him some seed. I started scattering some seed. Man, I was hoping it was going to penetrate his heart. At the end of the conversation, I asked him, I said, look, you, you can have the assurance of your relationship with God. You can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're unsure, would you like to be sure? I shared that with somebody who was 90 some years old. He said, Pastor, I'm not sure, I wanna be sure. And I shared the gospel with him. And you know what, he died and I, it was the most amazing thing. He died with the assurance. So I said the same thing to this guy. Would you like to have the assurance of your salvation and with, the, with coldness in his eyes? And anger on his lips, he said, a commanding no. Hard-hearted. Hard-hearted. Don't you know Jesus weeps over people like that? No. As I left, his wife said, Pastor, please don't upset my husband. And as I closed the door behind me, I thought to myself, Lady, you have no idea what upset is. He died. They asked me to do his service. They weren't going to have it in the church. They said we're going to have a graveside service. And you know, it was the coldest day. It was so cold that the people, the family, couldn't get out of their cars. And I thought to myself, we were down there at the cemetery. All the cars were there. And family was there, but they said, we're not getting out. It's too cold. And I thought, how appropriate. This day is comparable his heart. Jesus weeps over that. In that crowd that day were people who were hostile to Jesus, hated him, could care less about him, were uninterested in him than there were the interested people. It's like he was saying, they hear and they receive the word of God. But they receive it with excitement. Because they're looking for anything to excite their life. But because of what's in the heart, it goes away. Same thing with the people with preoccupation with the world. And so he's saying, learn this lesson. Listen, learn this lesson. There comes a point in a person's life that they go, they cross the line and he's warning them because he loves them. And we need to warn people who are like this. If you know people whose hearts are so hard because they've been hurt, you need to warn them. We need to warn them. Or caught up in the world. Maybe our kids are caught up in the world and they're abandoning their faith. We need to save them. Son, it's going to be choked out. Do you have kids like that? Do you have friends like that? You need to learn this lesson. The lesson is this. No one is saved by profession of faith saying, I believe. We are saved by possession of faith. <clears throat> possession of faith that develops and grows like the seed. There's evidence of a change that is unexplainable apart from him. Gospel-rooted people. We break away from the distractions of the world. We come to see that the, the promises of the pursuit of wealth and health and happiness are lies because they don't produce lasting happiness. Gospel-rooted people come to see that the word of God does not promise what the flesh craves, but so much more. So much more. So how does the soil, the heart of a sinful individual become good? How do you become good soil? 
One thing I know about dirt, it can't do much without help. I mean, the, the parable, is he, he knows. I mean, the only way good soil becomes good soil, it needs help. I went to see Joel this week. Some of you have been um, rejoicing. Joel's in jail, and he's going to go to prison. And I went to see him. His kid's heart was so hard for so many years. And when I got to see him, guess what? His heart, heart was, was tender. It's because of a lot of prayer. Years of prayer. And I got to lead him to Christ in jail. He's been set free in jail because of the gospel. Hard-hearted, sinful people. The only way we become good people is, look, it's what God does. Jesus is the farmer in the parable. He's the one who is spreading the seed. And everybody knows that farmers have to tend to the soil. And what he does is he, he responds to the soil, to the needs of the soil. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 says, The Lord your God, and this is strange language for a lot of us, will circumcise your heart. The Lord God will do this and the heart of your descendants so that you may love him. You can't love him without God. Doing something in the heart that you may love him with all your heart with all your soul and live. David cries out to God, create in me a clean heart, O God. That's the word. That's the word that we share. We share it with people who have experienced life's difficulties, who have abandoned, who have done this, and whose faith has dried up a long time ago. We need to share with them, look, it is God who will tend your soil. Let him. And you'll be shocked what God will do. 30, 60, 100. Amen? Amen. Father, we're grateful for this simple parable that has so much in it. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to fully digest and fully understand the, the meaning behind it. And we, we're thinking about family members. We're thinking about friends that uh, we say they are comparable to this, to these people. We live with this person. We know this person. We know these people. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord for them. We just need to share the gospel and pray it's not too late, but share the gospel. We need to share the gospel with people who are just like them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand together. We're going to have